good technique begins with the proper grip of the racket. Having an incorrect grip is the greatest handicap any squash player can have. Take your racket and hold it in your left hand at the center of balance. With your right hand, shake hands with your grip. Your index finger and your thumb should form a V with your forefinger slightly advanced toward the racket shaft. This will give more sensitivity to your touch. Now with the left hand, turn the shaft a fraction anti-clockwise to open up the face of the racket. It will give you a natural slice to the forehand and more importantly, much more control on the backhand and volley. Don't allow the head of the racket to drop. It'll make you slow preparing for each stroke. The actual grip should be firm and comfortable, but not too tight. Get used to the length of your reach, as the position of the ball varies so much. Each height represents a different zone of stroke play, and each zone will require a different stroke. Everybody's build, and therefore their reach, is different, and being used to the length of your reach will help you avoid mistakes and accidents. Squash is such a fast game that you have to respond to a whole sequence of events in order to coordinate and control your game. Your eyes watch and judge the situation. Your mind thinks what you're going to do. Your legs take you around the court to the ball. Your arms provide the power to generate the stroke. Your racket hits the ball. The ball hits the wall. The wall gives the bounce, and the bounce is what can stretch your opponent to the limit. Technically, the forehand and backhand drive are the most important strokes, but the action of these forms at least the basis of most of the other shots. Imagine swatting a fly. It's a wrist action with a compact whole arm movement, almost like throwing a ball. For the forehand drive, direct all your attention to the moment of impact. At impact, press the racket toward the target with a flick of the wrist. Follow through a short distance, the momentum will take the racket head up round the shoulder. Racket arm up above the shoulder with elbow bent for maximum power. As you hit, the weight is transferred to the left foot. There. Legs bent to help you get down to the ball, feet and body facing at right angles to the ball's path. Most beginners really dread the backhand. Top players usually prefer it though, as it's actually the more natural stroke and produces the greatest speed and accuracy. It has the force of the forehand, plus a twist of the shoulders to produce vital extra power. Position yourself at right angles to the path of the ball. Begin the action early. Raise your racket hand to shoulder height with your elbow pointing directly to the ground. The ball must be taken in front of the body with the weight transferred to the right foot at the point of impact. The shoulder movement precedes the arm movement and the body pivots naturally at the waist. The follow through must be compact and control and always allow yourself plenty of room for the swing. These drives and their variations, volleys, boasts and drop shots are the basic armoury of every player's game. Many rallies hang simply on these basic drives to a length. Practice hitting to a good length all the time. The direction of the drive cross court or down the wall will depend on how early or late you take the ball and how much you use your wrist. If you concentrate on keeping your grip tight, then what the wrist does tend to happen naturally. Tighten the fingers, but don't stiffen the grip. The height of the drive will depend entirely on how open or closed the racket face is at the moment of impact. If the ball passes you on either side, then you will have to use more of your wrist to obtain the correct angle. If you want to use deception, then wrist control is paramount. A squash court is a rectangular box with the front wall higher than the back. Squash is a game of angles, rather like snooker. You can hit the ball into any part of the court, depending on the angle at which you strike the ball. If you hit the back of the ball, it will go straight to the front wall and straight back. If you hit the right side of the ball, it will hit the left side wall before it hits the front wall and then the other side wall. This shot is called a burst. You can even reach the front wall by hitting the back wall first. 
and played at the correct angle, the ball will cling to the side wall. Hitting the ball to any part of the court will also depend on the angle of the racket face. The more open the racket angle, that is, with the head tilted back, the higher the trajectory of the ball. The other major element is power. With the same racket angle but different power, the ball will go to different lengths. Full power will send it to the back, medium power to the middle, and a soft touch will drop the ball in front. Even when you are at the back of the court, you can achieve a similar effect playing the ball short or long, either by using different power or different racket angle or different combinations of both. Just look at the angles Jahangir and Janshir Khan create to get the ball to every part of the court. The players use combinations of drives, drops and boasts to move the ball to all four corners and stretch the opponent to the limit. Each man has dazzling racket work and movement and each tries to create an opening to make a kill. Fitness makes a squash player much more efficient. There's little difference between what Jahangir is doing and what you should do. It's just that at the highest level and with long, grueling rallies, he has to do a lot more of it. Strength and endurance, speed and agility are vital to top-class squash players. One day, Jahangir will do distance work to improve his stamina. The next, he'll do different types of sprints to develop his speed. Many club players prefer just to go on court to bash the ball around and have some fun. But even for them, it's well worth paying attention to fitness. That's because it can also be their insurance policy against injury. By doing a little jogging, then going through the right exercises, you will help yourself avoid all sorts of physical problems. Although the squash court is small, there are lots of exercises you can perform on it. Make up your own routines using the length of court and the lines on it, moving forwards, backwards and sideways. Use long strides, short strides, running and stopping. By doing all this, you will be lubricating and loosening up your system for stretching and then rehearsing the movements you will be doing in the match. No matter what their standards, squash players need to be agile and supple. Stretching exercises like these should be done before and after a game as part of the warming up and cooling down process. On a cold court, it's best to wear a tracksuit during the warm-up and even in the early stages of a friendly game. Jahangir will exercise for 15 minutes. You may not need to do this much, but why not try to arrive even five minutes earlier for a short warm-up session? You'll be amazed at what a difference it makes. All players should do a few minutes of warming up to loosen the muscles and ligaments. Only then should they start on the stretching exercises.
for a good start, you need a good serve. Many players underestimate its value. It's not merely a method of starting a rally and putting the ball into play. It's something that can give you a real advantage. So there are three types of serve. One is high lob serve, bouncing the ball onto the side wall, dropping on the floor, hitting the back wall. Limits your opponent's angle to hit the front wall. Second serve, if opponent is hanging back into the center court, you can hit the ball hard into the side wall nick. The third one is, opponent is not expecting that you're always serving onto the side wall, so he turns. And that's the time to surprise him and hit the ball on opponent's right shoulder. So let's go through the first one, high serve. As rule say, you must put one foot in the box. Right, you put one foot in the box. Now, after the serve, you've got to move to the tee. So it's important that you put right foot there, left foot here. Now you're in a position when you serve, you can actually take one step and you're on the tee and take full advantage of your opponent's return. So, foot in the box, left foot out, check your grip, racket face open, look at the front wall where you're going to hit because the front wall is going to give you the right answer. Aiming right below the outline. High lob serve onto the side wall, remember. So let's go. The serve should strike the front wall and side wall and finish as close to the back wall as possible. To test how good your serve is, put a racket two racket lengths from the back wall and the ball should hit the side wall, then the floor, before finishing up in the area between the racket and the back wall. Right, now the second serve, which is hard hit just above the service line and bouncing the ball into the side wall nick because opponent is hanging somewhere here. Right, check your position, tight grip, Look at the target, throw, hit. Right. Now we have served high, lob serve, soft onto the side wall. We have served hard like tennis into the nick. The third serve is exactly the same, but this time instead of bouncing the ball into the side wall nick, you are actually hitting the ball on your opponent's right shoulder because opponent was expecting you that every serve is coming on left, so he might have even turned a little bit facing to the side wall. Take full advantage of that. Let's see. Again, check your grip. Look at the target. Right. We have done forehand lob serve. There's another variation of lob serve, which is a backhand lob serve. You put your left foot in the box, right foot forward, and serve backhand lob. There, and you move to the tee. Right, serve from the left court now. It's almost the same like you serve from the right. Three different serve, high lob serve onto the side wall, hard and low serve bouncing into the side wall nick, and the other one surprising your opponent hitting the ball onto his shoulder. This time you put your right foot in the box, left foot out, you're right underneath the ball. Now the angle of hitting the ball is different because this time you can actually go under the ball and if you slice the ball, turning the ball towards the side wall, then the ball will go parallel onto the side wall, which makes it cling to the side wall. Watch. Watch your opponent's position, check your grip, look at the target, and serve. The difference between a good serve and a bad one can be slight, but practice will give you the style and confidence to serve well consistently. A ground stroke is when the ball is struck after it's bounced on the floor. It's the most common and most important stroke in the game. It forms the basis of almost every rally. Sometimes players will hit 50 or 100 ground strokes in the course of a rally. It's therefore vital to develop your feel for the ball, and the first two routines will show you how to do this. Routines one and two look simple, but they're teaching you how the ball behaves. The first routine gives the eye, hand and wrist coordination when you hit the bottom of the ball on both backhand and forehand. By then going on to slice the ball, you will develop the right feeling for certain strokes. By next hitting the top of the ball, you will appreciate the bounce and learn how to keep the wrist loose. Try seeing if you can do 10 of these. During ground strokes, the ball should bounce in the green corridors to stop your opponent dominating the central position. As you improve, the corridor narrows. 
The third routine will help you hit ground strokes down the wall, starting from the front of the court, moving to the back, and then returning again. You're learning to hit the back of the ball, to keep the ball straight. At the front of the court, you'll learn to hit the ball short again in a drop shot. As you move back, you will be hitting the ball higher and harder to achieve a good length. The best length is when the first bounce is just behind the service box and the second bounce as near the back wall as possible. After the forehand, then go on to do the same on the backhand. Routine 4 will help develop cross-court ground strokes by yourself. As before, start from the front and move back, but this time hit the ball alternately backhand and forehand. To develop a cross-court, you will be learning to strike a different part of the ball from when you hit down the wall. Routine 5 is to help develop the boast. That's when the ball strikes the side wall first. Once again, you will be hitting forehands and backhands alternately, but this time moving diagonally back towards the center of the court. In routine six, you hit the ball in a figure of eight, alternately into each front corner of the court. This develops this snap and helps you learn to hit different parts of the ball, as well as to play the ball of the wrong foot. To do this, you will need to transfer your weight quickly from one foot to the other. Routine 7 has you hitting cross-court ground strokes, but this time with a coach. This more realistically recreates the match situation, because the player can adopt the proper footwork and use one stroke at a time, backhand or forehand. Routine 8 recreates match play better still because it stretches the players more. They move from the centre position to the ball at the front before hitting ground strokes, backhand cross court and forehand down the wall. Hit hard and low and move back to the T position in the centre each time. This is quite strenuous and a good fitness routine. It also helps develop movement forwards and backwards. It strengthens the legs the power of the stroke and the ability to place the ball accurately. Jahangir has his left foot forward for balance, his right arm up for power and his eye on the ball the whole time. To increase the pressure, the player must now return to the side wall instead of the team. It increases his mobility across the court and further strengthens his legs with the final stretching lunge as he approaches the goal. Routine 9 develops different kinds of boasts. At the front of the court, it is a tickle burst, where you pretend you are about to drive to a length but instead hit the ball to the side wall, thus wrong-footing your opponent. In mid-court, it is an attacking burst, taking the opponent who is behind you from the back to the front. At the back of the court, it is a defensive burst, when you have been forced back into a deep position yourself. look easy when they're done well, but they take time and practice to perfect. They'll certainly help you develop your game enormously. Bruno Brooks is a beginner, but he rapidly learned how to gain control of the ball. Book a court regularly for practice, instead of just playing a game. You can practice on your own, or with another player, or with a coach.
Forcing. Although we've seen a wide yeah, array of angles, boasts and cross courts in these routines, the, the most important it's ground stroke by far is straight down the wall to a long. length, keeping and the ball in the corridor stronger. we showed in routine and three, fitter. as Jahangir and, and Jeff Hunt harder. do here. These ground stroke routines are like the trunk of a tree from which all the other strokes grow. The volley, a shot hit before the ball bounces, is valuable both for taking the initiative and keeping it. It's the basis of an attacking game and if the ball's taken early, it'll put pressure on your opponent. Watch how Jahangir taking the ball early pressurizes Janshu. This rally ends with a mistimed volley into the center of the court. Just as with ground strokes, it's important to play the volleys accurately into the corridor. Routine 10 is similar to the one for the forehand ground stroke. Starting at the front and moving gradually to the back of the court, then returning to the front, all the time hitting the ball down the wall. As you move back, you hit the ball higher. Use a shorter swing for extra control. And notice the importance of keeping your eyes on the ball. It is perfect practice for the return of the serve. These routines are like the trunk of the tree we mentioned. And from these, we now show the other strokes branching out. Routine 11 is a mid-court volley and good practice for returning the ball to the front. It should be targeted with a steady wrist above the service line. By learning to hit this target, it will help you to make a kill when you need to place the ball just one inch above the tin. For routine 12, hit forehand and backhand volleys alternately, starting at the front of the court, gradually working your way to the back, and then returning again to the front. When you are at the front, it helps you to learn to play a cross-court volley. And when you are at the back, it helps you to learn to play a cross-court return. Routine 13 is used to develop the volley boast and to learn how to volley off the wrong foot. It's played alternately backhand and forehand, moving diagonally back from the front corner towards the centre of the court. Doing this for a long time will help strengthen your arm and grip. Remember, whatever routines you are practicing on the forehand, practice the same on the backhand, in order to keep an even balance for your ball control. Routine 14 is the figure of eight exercise on the volley, alternately backhand and forehand. It develops quick reactions, great rhythms, the movement of the body from the hip and the ability to play an accurate shot off the wrong foot. The trunk is in a steady position but swiveling with each shot. Routine 15 first has the player forehand volleying the ball to a length and moving to and from the central tee position between each shot. The opponent would have to be at the front of the court for this shot to be effective. When the opponent's at the back of the court, then you want to cut the ball off short. This can be done either with a hard overhead or a high volley to the nick, or a soft low volley drop into the nick. Stand almost square to the path of the ball to do this. Throughout all this, the coach's role is very important, leading to different lengths, different speeds and different directions so as to keep the player prepared for almost any situation. For accuracy, on the backhand side, get the right foot forward. But if you can't manage this, you can still hit a well-placed volley by pressing the racket towards the target. Try and develop the volley so that you aim for the nick all the time. For the less advanced player, who may not hit the nick quite so often, make sure the ball hits the side wall before the floor. Too many players lack the confidence even to try a volley. By doing these exercises, you'll develop the skill to be able to use the stroke in a match.
You can see here the importance of practicing a combination of forehand and backhand routines on each side of the court. Routine 16 is the cross-court volley. When you're on the tee, you hit the ball to force your opponent to the back of the court. When you're at the back, you place the ball high on the back wall to get yourself out of trouble. Both shots enable you to take the center of the court. The first one by driving the opponent back, the second one by giving you time to recover. Routine 17 is the volley to a length to take the opponent back and then a volley boast to bring the opponent forward. To do this, you have to hit two different parts of the ball. Do it on both the forehand and the backhand. Then move forward for an attacking volley boast on both sides. This is a good routine for fitness and for strengthening the arm, as the coach does not allow much time between shots. Routine 18 is a practice with another player instead of a coach. In this case, it's British champion Del Harris. Always practice with discipline. It's a good idea to make a game out of it with scoring to give you greater motivation. After doing cross-court volleys from the mid-court, the two players move forward and feed each other with volleys from the front court. They finish each exercise with a kill. Cooperation is vital for maximum benefit. In routine 19, one player hits down the wall on a volley, the other hits cross-court. Then they change position so they can combine these two types of volley. During routine 20, each player is alternately moving across to cut the ball off. One playing length to the back, the other playing a short volley drop to the front. This routine is a good exercise to speed up your footwork. And don't forget the forehand side as well. Although this exercise looks very fast and slick when done by Jahangir and Del Harris, it can be done by players of different standards. Here, Eddie Grant is enthusiastically doing the same thing with Aman Khan. Try to practice as often as possible before or after a friendly game. These player-to-player -player routines will help you, especially if you are both of a similar standard. these practice routines work for Jahangir in a match. He uses three different volleys, the volley drop, the volley cross court and the volley boast to take Jeff Hunt to different parts of the court. When many people talk about length, they think it means playing to the back of the court. But in fact, length means playing the ball to the furthest point from your opponent and this could just as well be to the front of the court as to the back. Jahangir and Jan Chikan may look as though they're simply sparring, playing the ball to the back. 
but they're also trying to create the opening for a telling blow to the front. Uh, zijn dit absolute topsporters. Ze trainen ongeveer vijf tot zes uur per dag. Ja. Ik sprak met de, met de coach van uh, Jan Schakaan vanochtend nog even. En, uh, die vertelde... If you want to play the ball to the back softly, this is the target band you must hit. If you want to play the ball to the back hard, this is your target band. These are the areas two front corners and two back corners where the ball should fall. Squash should be played in these four corners. How do you do that? The front wall will give you the right answer. Routine 21 gives two practices for length. It is a down the wall routine, similar to the ground stroke and volley routines we have seen. But now, Jahangir is undercutting the ball. And when he wants to send this shot to a length at the back, he follows through with the stroke. Or, if it is to go to the front, the follow through shortens. Routine 22 is another shot with a shortened swing, through which you can learn to play the ball to the front. The player must hit this shot low if he wants to play this drop shot. This is similar to the combination routine on the ground stroke. The difference being, he undercuts the ball and always keeps it low on the front wall. Routine 23 is a forehand boast, alternating with a backhand cross-court drop shot, keeping the ball low. Generally, most shots can be played off either foot. And this routine has been carefully designed to favor one foot at a time. It will also strengthen your legs. In routine 24, Jahangir is using a lot of slice on both backhand and forehand. The result is to take the pace off the ball and give him maximum control. Again, a similar routine to the volley combination moving across the short line. Keeping the ball low is crucial if you are to master the attacking game. In routine 25, Jahangir feeds himself and plays the same sliced drop shot, but from different angles into the nick on both sides. A slice can also be used on an overhead or high forehand volley cross court into the nick. Routine 26 is somewhat similar. It's done with a coach to make a more realistic situation. Jahangir uses a combination of backhand and forehand drops. Notice once again the heavy slice and good early preparation. is the straight drop. Try and keep the ball clinging to the side wall, which can make the opponent miss hit. Because you don't have much angle, it is difficult to put the ball into the nick. But you can still make it hard for the opponent by putting the ball right on the side wall. Practice this from varying distances, even from the back. As you develop more control, you will be thinking more and more about using this clinger. Routine 28 demonstrates the next development as you become more skillful. You must play the ball into the same corner, aiming for the nick from any part of the court. Jahangir is given little time to anticipate. Just as he is getting a rhythm, the routine is changed by varying the angle of the feet.
Routine 29 is a combination of ground stroke drop and volley drop. Jahangir alternates the two strokes and the sides on which he does them, forehand and backhand. Wherever the ball comes, there is no excuse not to play it short. If you play a good drop shot, be ready for a weak return from your opponent. Routine 30 is a different combination of drop shots, tickle boasts and attempted winners to the bag. After you played a drop, the opponent may play a drop in return. So if Jahangir has failed to make a winner here, he may well succeed next time by playing a different shot to the back. This is a dual role exercise where you can act as both yourself and your opponent. Don't forget to use both sides of the court. Routine 31 is one of the most basic and important practices. Try to hit 100 straight drives off one bounce. This is good for keeping the ball in the corridor down the wall, getting a good length and strengthening the arm. Even if you fail on the 99th stroke, you must start again. In routine 32, you're hitting the drives to a long length at the back, alternating cross courts with straight drives. This is great practice for the basic back of court game. The court stands and threatens on the tee to make you use the corridor up and down the wall and wide across the court. In routine 33, two players demonstrate the same practice. Martin Lemoyne and this time playing with Lisa Ropi. It can be done in a game with scoring. One player can hit a cross court and one down the wall and then change roles. or they can concentrate on hitting down the wall only. In routine 34, one player feeds anywhere and the other player hits only down the wall. The player who's feeding can really practice all the shots, boasts, drives, drops and volleys. The other player who's practicing hitting to a good length can also change to cross courts. This routine will teach you attacking and defensive squash and will also help you move quickly to the four corners and develop discipline. Routine 35 is extremely tough, but by now you should be well able to tackle it. It's drop countered by drop and drive countered by drive. It teaches you to drop from the front and drop from the back, to play a length from the front and a length from the back. It is a perfect practice for moving your opponent from front to back and for changing the pace. It is also a great routine for developing fitness. Routine 36 provides length practice, alternating between a volley and a ground stroke to the back of the court. The two players each hit two consecutive strokes, one hard and one high, with the second player feeding off the high stroke of the other. Martin and Lisa are of course world-class players. Although they are going through routines here with each other, each one benefits from one-to-one -one instructions from her own coach.